Um, so last week's homework uh, assignment was to review the chapter on the four foundations of mindfulness if you're going through the course with us. And I'd like to hear uh, what you learned. And if you have any questions or comments, I'll start with Kevin. Good to see you this morning. Good to see you, Joe. I really appreciate you going through the course again. And uh, you know, the four foundations of mindfulness are tough teachings for me to recall. But when I read them, I realize that um, you know, by doing the practice of Shemaka Vipassana meditation and being mindful of feelings and thoughts and returning to breathing, I think. I don't know if that's enough, but you know, I think I'm getting near the four foundations of mindfulness or what to hold in mind. And what I want to hold in mind is the right intention. So I think it's kind of leading me towards the, the, the later chapters in the course. So I might need a little bit of a refreshing on the teachings. It's been a couple of weeks, but I think I'm getting it. So great. I think you're getting it too. I mean, that's the. There's nothing terribly complicated about the four foundations of mindfulness, and they do point uh, to be developing the ability to not be distracted by thoughts or feelings that are arising and be able to maintain, uh, be mindful, uh, hold in mind to recollect right intention, intention to recognize an abandoned craving and clinging. So that's, that is essentially the, the, the teachings on the four foundations. So good for you. You get an A. <laughs> now let's see how Helen does. <laughs> oh, Helen, I'm sorry, can you do me a favor? Could you move just two or three inches to the right? That's good. I want to keep my eye on Diane. Uh, I'm <laughs> following for the camera. It, oh, no, it, it's too bad. Every, every now and then I look up and she's making funny faces. And it's just, it's got, got to be all the control. Helen, it's good to see you this morning. Thank you, John. It's good to be here. It's good to see so many faces I haven't seen before or haven't seen That's in a right. long, long time. <laughs> so it's great to be here. Um, I'm not through reading the chapter, but I am reading it. And um, again, it's uh, something I've heard before. It's it's all that easy and it's all that hard. Yeah, yeah. And um, the best thing about it, though, is the awareness you gain from it, whether it's five seconds before or the five seconds after. And um, so I'm kind of thinking about... Um, installing a five second delay in myself <laughs> so that um, I can reach that point of, of being clear and being kind and um, you know, just you know considering you don't always know something about the other person before you make a judgment and um, you know just trying to choose my words carefully or or observe noble silence if I haven't gotten there yet. So it's, it's a great tool, set of tools for your tools. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm enjoying it. And I'm also finding that as I just, you know, meditation just comes up in conversation a lot. And um, I'm finding that the more seeds I plant, the more people are interested in learning more about it. Mm -hmm. So that's been great. And it, I'm also, um, I'm, I'm on this woman's blog site, it's for landscape business, but the most recent one was all about um, time. There is no time, there's only now. And it was just so poignant for what we've been talking about. Um, so it's it's popping up everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Thank you for, for saying that. Yeah, you're so right. We need to develop that five second oops alarm. Mm -hmm. And this brings it to you. Um, Again, the four foundations of mindfulness are primarily used in meditation to teach us to be mindful off our cushion. So we, we're gaining control of, of how we think and how we react. And that simple process of becoming mindful of the sensation of breathing in our bodies, the first foundation of mindfulness, it brings us into what's occurring right now. Mm -hmm. And so what's occurring in meditation isn't a lot, but that gives us the ability to recognize that feelings come up and we can just be dispassionate about those feelings and recognize that thoughts are often driven by feelings. And sometimes it's just the reverse, that a thought brings up a feeling and to simply be present with it. And that gives us the ability to develop that five second oops alarm. And then ultimately, that fourth foundation of mindfulness to be mindful of the present quality of our mind. That's the final instruction that I give at the end of most meditations. And that's all it is to be to have this dispassionate 
mindfulness of, of the present quality of my mind without needing it to be any different than it is. And to recognize, good morning, Maura, and to recognize that it is the process of reacting or not reacting to feelings and thoughts that result in the present quality of our mind. In other words, if we're reacting to what's occurring in our life, we're going to have a disturbed and agitated and distracted mind. And if we're able to simply observe that process, then our, the quality of our mind is at peace, which is the ultimate goal of the Dhamma too. So, thank you. Anthony, good to see you this morning. How are you? you? John. Um, just picking up on what's been said here, it, it's very true. It's so true that, my, that mindfulness has applications in all realms because I use it with clients you know, before their depositions. Could you imagine if everything you said is being typed and put into a transcript, how important it is to put that five second delay? Mm -hmm. And I always say that. Think think about the question and take a few seconds. I actually think I use the number five mm -hmm. to think about what your answer is going to be before you say it. Yeah. Don't and I will go through this whole thing. Don't judge the other attorney. They're just doing their job. They're here to learn the facts. They're not here to make you look bad. Uh, they're just here to get it right. And they have thoughts in their head about wanting to go, you know, can I wrap this up before lunchtime? Am I going to be at home to see the kids tonight? You know, they're not specifically thinking of you. Uh, and if you start to form judgments, take a break. Because what happens when you get angry? You start to say things you don't mean. Yeah. So it really does have applications in, in life. And um, I, uh, I'm starting the 10-week practicum to teach mindfulness. And it was great to see how much credit they give to Buddhist traditions and in, in what they formed because it's the same thing like what you what you wrote is exactly what mindfulness is yeah. to notice the thoughts and not judge them and, and allow them don't, don't put too much significance to them and allow them to pass yeah. it's the same thing it's just they just made it more secular oh yeah yeah and that that and what you described about not taking what the other lawyer is saying personally. That's really the whole, the essence of the Dhamma too. Nothing is personal. Nothing is happening to me, but if I see it happening to me, then I've created an identity that's prone to confusion, delusion, and suffering. And if I can be depersonalized in that way, then nothing's gonna bother me. And, yeah. and, and, and I'm much more, I'm able to be much more present in life situations, in a courtroom setting, in an adversarial setting, or just in life in general. And it, again, in the, the Buddha taught how to be happy, how to be peaceful in our life. He really wasn't concerned about anything else because he realized that's the essence of human life. How do we do it? Stop taking things so personally. Well, I always tell him it's only personal if you make it personal. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Brett, good to see you. Good to be here. Um, <clears throat> haven't been here in a while, but uh, it's nice to hear, hear everything about mindfulness. And, uh, and so it's, it's, uh, it's good to hear that. And, um, that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to see you. It's good to see you this morning. Diane, how are you? No funny faces. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I was, what was going through my mind when you said, notice the quality of your mind? I'd like to hear it. I was thinking, I'm so thankful for indoor plumbing. <laughs> 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 when you said that, I just, <laughs> Anyway, so the, the quality of my mind. Right? <laughs> um, one of the things this week of uh, I've been conscious of mindfulness very much all week, and uh, <clears throat> I one of the things I've been doing is noticing when I'm not conscious of not being mindful, and I just kind of splurge and uh, you know forward kind of thing, and it's. What I've noticed in it, in the splurt, you know, sp you know, spilling forth, or, I guess, or in the mindfulness moments, um, this loving, this meta, the loving, practicing loving kindness with myself first, just continually to conti continually tends to rise in my thinking and in my actions, um, which goes along with what everyone has said so far, that um, without, when you don't judge someone, it leaves the door open to appreciate and, and to be not 
judging and critical. Because when I, I, I was going up the stairs the other day and I just was watching my mind and, and I was thinking, you've made so many mistakes, you are so stupid. And then all of a sudden, the thought, be gentle with yourself, came to mind. And um, I, I continued walking up the stairs saying, boy, that is such a relief to, to be gentle with myself and to practice loving kindness. And by the time I got to the stairs, I had a whole 180 degree turnaround in my thinking. And it's just, I mean, I'm not doing this perfectly by a long shot, but just to have these thoughts in my mind and know that they're be coming up and, and replacing other thoughts, more negative thoughts with loving kindness thoughts is, I think it's great. So I'm very thankful for indoor plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> Which that's kind of a metaphor. <laughs> I, yeah, thank you. I, I'm very fond of indoor plumbing, especially in the winter. Too. I'm glad my dog isn't. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned uh, it's so important to be gentle. It's it's surprising, not surprising. Um, it's significant to me how often that comes up to people that are just starting to develop the Dhamma and realize how important that is. Um, Yesterday, one of our Sangha members got married to Alex, and I officiated at the ceremony, and she incorporated that gentleness into the vows that, she, that they shared. She said that, I vow to be gentle with myself, and so I can be gentle with you, Alex. It was a beautiful thing to say, yeah. And it was at that point that her mom broke down. So. <laughs> yeah, it was nice. Jen will be back next Saturday. So. Lisa, good to see you this morning. How's your practice going? And how's your study? Um, well, I am meditating every day in this way because I do other kind of meditations but I read in the book that you don't replace you know you don't use them as the meditation which you're supposed to do yeah. so like sitting up and yeah um, but it, it's it's not regular and it's not 20 minutes but it's something something every day so um, I'm thankful for that <laughs> and So you're describing in a, in a a very general way what it's like to start developing the Dhamma. So you're right, they're very simple and straightforward teachings, but because they're um, often contrary to the views that we have, it, we have a very difficult time just simply incorporating them into our lives. You use the, the term um, a hard shell. That's just another word for the common problem that everyone has of conditioned thinking. When we have it, it feels like we're unique in the way that we see the world, but it really is that common human problem of conditioned thinking uh, that the, the Buddha created an eightfold path to simply 
be able to develop the individual ability to recognize our conditioned thinking and simply abandon it. And it, but it takes a process. Uh, and as far as your meditation practice, um, don't be so concerned. I don't think you are about 20 minutes. Any time, two, three, four, five minutes is, is a, a plenty amount of time to start establishing a meditation practice. And you're right that you don't have to give up other meditation practices. But while you're doing this, this is a, just a different type and a different focus with a, with a different framework. And over time, you will, you will diminish that hardened shell, that conditioned thinking, and it, you start seeing how this all fits together. But it does take, uh, you know, it, it takes a lot of repetition. One of the reasons why we're going through the course again this year is because we went through it last year. And if you notice, some of the people have a different perception. They're saying, I see this now where I didn't see it before. And even the way that the book itself is structured, and it, it, it took me a while to put the, the, uh, the, the study chapters into the order that they're in, because I guess you could put it almost any way, but this is, I think, the most coherent way, because each week lays a foundation for what you'll learn in the next week, and the following week gives you perspective on what you just learned. And so by the end of the, end of the book, you'll have a complete picture but continued practice will develop that framework in your life. So I'm glad you're here this morning. Jay, good to see you this morning. How are you? Good to see you. Doing okay. I had a nice meditation here, and I was more focused than usually at home. Uh, I guess there is something to the Sangha approach for sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, my problem generally at home when I'm uh, trying to meditate, keep the thoughts aside, is in the end, I'm a seven year old. You know, I'm thinking about lunch, I'm thinking about candy, I'm thinking about these, you know, all that stuff, all the craving and all the clinging, and, uh, you know, I can't get over that, but uh, I think I'm doing okay, and sometimes you don't have to know, you don't have to know how your car engine works, you just have to know that when you get in there and drive, it drives, yep. so with the meditation, I feel like uh, it's having a beneficial effect, it's, it's, it's helping me with a little more quality of mind, calmness of mind, but... Uh, I don't remember before this and the eight that all the time. I'm not really confused with that, but like I say, you know, sometimes you don't have to know how it works as long as it works. Yeah, so, that's my situation. Well, and, and thank you for saying all that. It is that's that's the process. You don't have to know how it works, you, but you do develop the ability to integrate it into your life, and that's just what you're doing. The um, the initial phase of simply recognizing that you're thinking like a seven-year-old, to use your words, and you're caught up in, in you know, wanting the candy bar or this and that, is, is the beginning. It's the foundation of mindfulness. You're gaining the ability to see how you think. The Tibetan word for meditation is gom, G-O-M, and that means to become familiar with, to become familiar with your own mind, and that's the foundation. First, you see where you are. Then you can start changing it. But we need a technique or a vehicle to be able to see that most of us are so distracted by our thoughts we don't even realize that we have the ability to recognize and change the way we think it's just that's another aspect of conditioned thinking or habitual thinking we just think this way because we've always thought this way even though it leads to confusion delusion and suffering we don't realize we can change it until we have this tool so, and that's the beginning part of it so thank you for saying that eva good to see you this morning how are you Overwhelmed with happiness um, because I just am so happy to see that everyone is benefiting from this practice and that we're bringing it out into the world with our individual ways of being out there in the world now that we've changed and can express ourselves from that point. And uh, I'm most happy because I feel like I've opened up from the shell. I was embedded in and that the gentleness that I find in there that I was afraid of and I used to hide because it didn't fit in the world and so I had to protect myself and I had to be like the you know follow the, the routine and um, and I feel that I have found within that gentleness some courage to say, well, this is really who I am, 
and I'm just, I have to be that. I cannot pretend anymore. I'm tired. It's exhausting. This is so much easier. And, uh, and I'm just so incredibly happy. I can't put it into words. <laughs> you, you put it into beautiful words. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I remember, and we, we all come into the Dhamma uh, with certain conditioning. I remember when you first came to Regalsville and, and the, the change in, in you and all of it. It's just remarkable. Um, the, uh, one, of the, one of the Brahma Viharas, the, the exalted mind states that we develop through the Dhamma is sympathetic joy. I think the word is Rebecca. Um, and that's what you just, you were expressing that. And the Buddha said that the, the highest form of that sympathetic joy is the joy we take when we see the Dhamma developing in other people. And that's one of the reasons why the Sangha is so important, because we get to experience that through, through other people. We get to see it. Sitting in this seat, it, it's one of the most remarkable and, and meaningful things that I can experience to see other people get it. And we're so fortunate to have a Sangha that's this well-focused and developing the Dhamma together. So thank you for pointing that out. Laura, you don't have to sit in the corner when you come in late. <laughs> I like it here. It's a very familiar place. Oh, that's <laughs> When Moore and I live together, I often put her in a corner. <laughs> Maybe that's why it didn't work out. I <laughs> The dog house is a very familiar place. <laughs> I feel like I'm bat battling with the heater. I can hear you. Um, but I was I was listening. Uh, I'm just gonna move because I can't hear myself. Basically, um, I was listening to what people were saying and thinking about my own um, my own maybe the journey with the Dhamma or something. You know, is that um, the the feeling of like that initial feeling like, oh, this is so nice to sit down and quiet and then you see all this noise. And, and then like for, I know my own experience, it's just kind of like, oh, I can't get my mind to settle back to the breath for a, for a long time. So I guess what I'm, what I'm starting to realize with a, like the four foundations of mindfulness is that the piece of recognizing your thoughts um, and returning to the breath, I'm, I'm putting a, more emphasis on going, yeah, to, on that little piece. Because I know, you know, what's been said for how long are we going to come here, you know, that, that's, you know, that's all part of the practice, but really embracing that as part of the practice. And what I found is that, um, like, like acknowledging that piece um, is really strengthening like peripheral awareness, and which is mindfulness, which is non-self-centered and um, less self-referential, <coughs> and um, has a greater vision. So I mean, it's been interesting to see that slight <clears throat> shift in my meditation and how it ripples out into my day. So I've always, you know, we, we've talked about so much, um, mindful of keeping in mind the Dhamma and, and the path and all that, but this has just put a little bit of a finer point and motivated me a little bit more to see how that's strengthening that point. Thank you. That's yeah. That again. That's a, that's another essential understanding of why we do what we do. The uh, the Vitaka Santana Sutta, the Sutta on the relaxation of thoughts. Uh, in that Sutta, the Buddha says we gain the ability to think what we want to think when we want to think it. And that again, that's an that's an essential part of this to gain control of our thinking. So the implication is that we don't, and we don't. And sometimes it has felt to me over the years that the way that the teachings come across, like you're doing this to yourself and like, okay, so we bring this whole sense of gentleness in, which is, is highly helpful and softening and accepting, all that very, very helpful, of course. And then you kind of hit a brick wall where 
still. <clears throat> To understand how the mind actually works and how challenging the mind is, and we're not taking it personally. Yes, we all know that intellectually, and you practice that. But to really soften and gentle, and okay, the person will do this, do that, etc., do that, of course. But that there is a, um, it is the way that attention works, and it is particularly in this challenging society of multitasking that totally reinforces a very difficult, challenging mind state, uh, attentional state that does not strengthen mindfulness and peripheral awareness and all that. So um, I guess that was kind of my, my wanting to say that um, to recognize how challenging it can be in particular. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> yeah, that, that, and that's why the, the Buddha taught mindfulness in, in two applications. One is the four foundations of mindfulness that we're discussing. And then he taught to be mindful of each factor of the Eightfold Path, because that's the framework for recognizing and abandoning that type of thinking that only can lead to more confusion, delusion, and suffering. We have to do it. We have to have a, a, a practice and a framework for doing that. Thank you, Mark. Mary, good to see you this morning. I kind of fell off the wagon because I was away, but I was surprised the couple of times I did meditate while I was away, I was able to just to get right back in the groove and you know, sit right back in when I got home. But what I also noticed is that I am able to, just in general, remind myself to, A, pay attention to what I'm doing at the moment and not, I mean, multitasking is a mess. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, um, and then pull myself back into what I am doing. And also, I am so much better at tempering what comes out of my mouth. Um, it's a good help. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the right speech is such an important aspect of this because it shows us where our behavior is taking us. Uh, well, it, 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 it's just remarkable how, as we integrate these simple teachings, even though there's some, it's difficult at times to integrate it. How in it in such a practical way it, it benefits our lives, and you expressed that beautifully. Thank you, Debbie. Good to see you this morning. Good to see you, and everyone. Oh my God, so so many beautiful, profound things have been said that um, you know that I have that much to say, but um, it really resonated with what Eva said and with what Laura said. And um, wow, that's good. <laughs> um, you know, because I'm always still very much struggling with my mind in meditation. It's really hard for me to settle my mind. Um, and I, you know, so you know, so it's it's that challenge was that was really validating. Like you said so validating, and um, and it is just coming back and coming back and coming back. Yeah. That helps me settle and feel like okay, I'm doing this, you know. And um, and I'm also just first of all, I did do my homework, which was good. It took me like <laughs> three different sittings to get to read that, but it was it's helpful. And it was my second time reading it because I haven't finished the whole book yet, but I had read that chapter, and so that was helpful. And what I guess for me in terms of the mindfulness was. What I'm seeing for myself is that I'm much more aware of what's going on with me. And so often my thoughts and recognize, and the inside has been bigger and more, and so much more recognition of fear based thinking and how so much is based in fear. So every little worry, every little, you know, projection, whatever. So I'm really trying to work with. Um, just okay, I feel so I got in touch with that. That's good. So I'm just trying to be with the fear for and breathe into it and, um, and then let go. And um, that's been really, really helpful. And, and even when I find myself not being mindful and then aware that I, you know, I stepped kind of back where I didn't want to be in relationship and wasn't 
coming from a mindful, helpful place, then I can recognize sometimes too that there's fear around that too. You know that I'm, I'm going backwards, I'm messing up, that I haven't been gentle, and loving, and kind, and life makes me feel sad. But I really, I feel like there is, you know, there's a lot more insight, I guess what I'm saying. So, so that's what this chapter was about a lot for me, the mindfulness yeah. in my present day, in my relationships, in my work, and that kind of online stuff. Thank you. you. You described that process beautifully. And, and the, um, these conditioned fears that we have, unless we have a way of looking at them in reality, we don't even realize that we have a choice about being fearful or not because we don't see them as a, as an, um, as a culmination of a thinking process that's rooted in ignorance. And when we start recognizing it, sometimes it can be um, it can be very hard to just even accept that fact because the um, the profound nature of the realization that I am really in control of how I think and how I feel can be overwhelming at first until you realize that there is a great gentleness in simply recognizing that the present quality of your mind knowing where it came from and simply letting it go. And that, and whatever the fears might come up in the next moment. And the four foundations of mindfulness teach us to just be present with it. It's what's occurring. They're all impermanent mind states. Come back to the sensation of breathing. Come back to what's occurring. And eventually we were able to let go of the triggers in our conditioned thinking that lead to fear. And thank you for describing it. I think a lot more clearer than I just did, but thank you. <laughs> Lorna, good to see you. Uh, I must have felt your love and kindness right now. Because actually, I've read the wrong chapter. <laughs> so, Take more spot, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you're you're taking the you're coming Tuesday nights and Saturdays. Know, so it, it gets confusing. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm kind of like a step ahead, but. Um, <clears throat> So, um, just, just to outline just what I've caught myself being mindful of lately, uh, or this week, is that, and this seems macabre and horrible, but it isn't that way, but um, I've been, it crosses my mind sometimes that when you're observing life, that this is like you're just observing life, but it's going to go on when I'm not here too. Okay. And in a way, you're kind of looking at your own mortality. Mm -hmm. But it's it's just a flash in my mind. It's not a nothing to be upset about. Yeah. It's just to recognise mm -hmm. that that life is going on and. I'm not always going to be here to enjoy it. And I'm just beginning to sort of have these thoughts of that. Um, so that's, that's one thing. And then, actually, I have a question, but it's on the next chapter. Um, can I just read? Because I didn't understand this bit. Sure. But it, it's actually from the... Um, it's on the Four Noble Truths? Four Noble Truths, yeah. And I've got glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, right, you say it's helpful to begin to objectify your ego personality. That's the sentence. Mm -hmm. I don't understand that. I don't, how do I do that? I don't, you know, I don't understand what you're asking me to do. Can you explain what you're asking me to do? But this is from the novel, from number two. So if you want to skip it, mm -hmm. I have no idea what it means. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> what, what it, it, what it the, in the context of that of the, the chapter, what it's referring to is that we, this ego personality. It's the Buddha uses the description of it's like foam on an ocean. There's nothing really there, but because 
because it's a self-referential view. In other words, this, this false view of self seems real because it's the only thing that we know of. So we've objectified this thing that is only like, like foam on an ocean. We've, we've created something that seems real to us. And what that really is, I'm not, I don't even know if I took this line out of the book or not, but I, I think I left it in. It's like a it's like a sleight of hand that we're playing on ourselves. We're the magician and we don't realize we're the magician. We're creating this false identity that it is rooted in ignorance and can only contribute to confusion, delusion, and suffering. We've objectified this thing. We've made something real. It is like from on an ocean. And as you develop this, as you develop the Dhamma, you're also talking about um, recognizing that we're not here forever. When the Buddha described dukkha, the first thing he said is birth is suffering, sickness is suffering, aging is suffering, death is suffering. He's just pointing out to us to, to recognize the fleeting nature of our own life. And when we really understand that, then we get to the, to the, um, to the right motivation to realize that we have one life to do this in, meaning one life to awaken. What's more important? We better get to it. We better stop objectifying ourselves and thinking that that's real. And then we gain the ability to see things in reality, which is what? We, we have a common peaceful mind that is able to be mindful of our life as life occurs. But there's no conceit in it. There's no eye making. It's life's just flowing. We're simply present with what's there. And so when sickness arise, we, arises, we know that it's a temporary state. When health arises, we don't get uh, self-aggrandize over how wonderful we are, that we're healthy. We just recognize it's part of another state. And when we're coming up against aging, that's the same thing. And, you know, I know you've heard me say this quite often. I can tell from the questions that people ask and the comments that they make whether they're getting it because the question is framed properly. And your comment is framed within the Eightfold Path, so it shows that you've, you've developed it in a very useful and effective way. So, thank you. I hope I answered your question. Can we just say one more thing? Sure. Like, that this is, we give, you know, do one year and something on the year tomorrow. So this is the time to make a new year for solution, etc. Just following that thought, um, I would like to be able to hold in mind next year that awakening is the most important thing in life because I think that would help filter out a lot of stuff in life that you, 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 you look at and you know, analyze and sometimes you know, over analyze why. But if you can hold that thought in your mind, I think it would help filter out stuff. So that's going to be my New Year's resolution. Great intention. Great for you. Yeah. Great intention. Yeah. Well, that, that's ex that's another that's another aspect of the eightfold path, and it's part of right intention, the intention to recognize and abandon craving and clinging, and it's also part of something that we'll talk about here in three weeks. I think right effort. Right effort is is being mindful that we need to put in some effort, meaning we we need to meditate, and we need to put in some effort. It's not a lot to develop the entire Eightfold Path as a framework for our life. Right. So you think that your reflection about mortality too, though, like the more we get, like I didn't find that for copper at all, like the more we, we can turn towards the fleeting nature of our lives, the more the energy rises, sometimes you could say what we teach that was just because that's in other traditions, perhaps that's how it's said, I'm not there, but I feel that energy and motivation rising more and more like the only thing important yeah. is to awaken because everything else just seems, you know, it's just a distraction and it leads us to do that, it leads yeah. us to suffering, it's dissatisfaction, irritation, you know, so it's, it's a good fun. Yeah, I'm a, yeah. So, and then it may be, well, maybe when we walk out of here, so how do I want to utilize my next breath? Yeah. Oh, <laughs>
the term that more use bodhicitta. But bodhi means awakened, citta means mind. So it, it, we hold in mind, we aspire towards awakening. And that's what's framed by the right intention, it's framed by the Eightfold Path, but it's informed by right intention and right effort. <coughs> so, yeah, I think that's a, that's a pretty good um, New Year's resolution to awaken this year. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that the Dalai Lama says, I don't agree with every single thing he says, but I, I think this is one of the most important things he ever said, is the purpose of time is to awaken. That's why we're here. There's nothing more important. There's nothing more valuable. There's nothing that we can do that will bring as much peace and happiness into our lives, but to awaken it, to gain full human maturity. I think it's really helpful. I mean, it's, I know you're repeating this, but I think it's, it might even be the Buddha's words, or you know how he says there's tasks associated with the Eightfold Path. When, when in wrong view, you know, enter and remain in right view. Yeah. And when in wrong intention, and, and it just that's how we can sort of get back on track because you know, life life will throw you curveballs. It's gonna it's gonna point you away from this. I mean, you know, yeah. 2017, everybody. Well, we have a New Year's resolution. Let's set intentions. Well, what do you set it? You know, are you just setting an intention that's not grounded in right view. Well, you can set those all your whole life, and they're just gonna go nowhere. You know, they yeah. kind of they're they're not grounded in right view and profound right view. And, and until that is developed, intentions don't really. I mean, they can they're they're great. You know, I can be a great person in 2017, but. What's that coming from? That's coming from self-referential. It's coming from wrong view. It's, it's just going to flee. Yeah. It's just impermanent. You know? So it's, it just brings you back to when in wrong view, just get back on in right view. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That, Peel another layer off of it. And just keep. There's more to that. It's never yeah. gonna. It's, you're gonna every year. There's more right view. There's more right intention, and it's that's why we do this. That's why we do it yeah. until we attain that profound right view of an awakened human being. And that's exactly how the Buddha taught mindfulness in relation to the Eightfold Path, to be mindful when we're in the unskillful or the wrong aspects and, and to remain into the right aspects. And, and they are tasks and they're tasks that are supported by very specific skills that we develop. The primary, primary, primary skill, the primary skill is concentration. That's why we meditate deep in that concentration so that we can hold in mind and recognize when we're not in accordance with the eightfold ten. It's really appreciative yeah. because I, I, I hear that and I hear your your voice and your words. So I don't know, that's a pretty amazing moment to hear it coming through you. And I know it's you saying it, but I know you're it's the Buddhist you know it's come it's really right there that's that's pretty amazing that it's coming the Buddhist saying remain in right view but I can hear your voice saying it to me. And you repeating it, so it's just like the twenty six hundred years ago thing. It's just, it's just amazing to think. Well, I think about it's a little unsettling, but yeah. Well, uh, all right, fine. <laughs> uh, not to be not to be so flippant about yeah. it. One of the things that is um, that I think we're so fortunate to have, and it's it's one of the most amazing things in my life is that the simple teachings that a human being gave over 2,600 years ago are still present and available to us today in the exact same way and form that he presented it. And when you really understand how that's been accomplished through the, through the different Buddhist councils and the, and the way that the Pali Canon has been actually structured, it really is, I don't believe in miracles, but it is as close to a miracle as we have, that they're still here. And they're, they are just as pure as they were. So I always talk about, we hear in different traditions about lineages, and those lineages are usually expressed through certain teachers, and that's fine. That's what they, that's how they look at it. But the true lineage of the Dhamma began 2,600 years ago by Siddhartha Gautama, and it's present here in each mind that's able to understand and implement that. That's the true lineage of the Dhamma. And it's remarkable that here it is in this room. And because he was so skillful in how he laid out the path. I think that that's such a an incredibly generous gift because it's so direct. You don't have to. I, I'm not minimizing the Bible and say, but like, what do you do? You know, like that's why I, I love this path that just keeps you know bringing it 
fact is very clear. So it's been able to, and yes, there's been all kinds of adulterations and interpretations, etc. But peel it back and come back, um, and it's all right there, contained. You know, contained, and very specific directions how to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to love thy neighbor as thyself, like that, but like because there isn't always a clear path of how to. Yeah, I love them when you don't even like them. <laughs> yeah, again, the, the, that's one of the things that the Buddha considered for two weeks after his awakening. How are you going to teach this to people with such conditioned minds? And that's why he developed an eightfold path so that we can we could do that. Thank you, Liz. Good and to see you. Oh, how did he do it? <laughs> somehow, <laughs> somehow we did it. Um, I, everyone should experience the profound blessing of going last <laughs> because all the wisdom has been revealed. So thank you, everyone, and happy new year. And let's all awaken in 2017. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. Thank you. Thank you. Diane? I, I think it's a Zen thing. Um, there, no room for that. Yeah. Let's yeah. Go. <laughs> Before enlightenment, chop wood and haul water. Chop wood, After carry enlightenment, chop, chop wood and haul water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. You know, it's it's hard to tell uh, an awakened human being from an, an unawakened human being, except if you look closely, you'll notice they're very very present. That sounds like a joke. <laughs> <laughs> How do you tell? <laughs> Yeah, what is that Joe did The Dalai Lama walks into a pizzeria and he says, I'll have one with everything. Uh. <laughs> so that's my that's my uh, happy new year joke. <laughs> uh, this is non-Dama related, can I say it? Okay, but we need to get to the teaching. Yes, what oh, is it? Oh, we're teaching? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was the end of class, so I'll wait for it. Okay, so yes, I'm introducing this week's study uh, on the Four Noble Truths, and I know I've said these be, what I'm going to say before at most classes, uh, but to put this in a con into context, um, the Buddha taught Four Noble Truths as an expression of his understanding of the truth of human life in a phenomenal world, and the truth of that is. Um, reflected in the understanding of the three marks of existence, which are anicca, anatta, and dukkha. Anicca is impermanence. Anatta is, means not self, and I'll explain that in just a second, and the resulting dukkha. Dukkha results from a misunderstanding of who we are in relation to this impermanent world that we live in. And the reason why that creates difficulty is we think that we're permanent. And we think that who we are in this moment is fixed, and that's part of conditioned thinking. And because we don't recognize that all things are always in a constant change, a constant state of change, we create a lot of confusion and deluded thinking in our lives. So when the Buddha awakened, he awakened to dependent origination. Dependent origination states it's up on the board. Dependent origination states from ignorance to 12 observable causative links comes all manner of confusion, delusion, and suffering. Now the Buddha is not saying that simply that we're because we're human beings that we're inherently ignorant in everything. It's a very specific type of ignorance, and it's ignorance of Four Noble Truths. And to that end, the very first teaching that the Buddha ever presented was the teaching on the Four Noble Truths, which makes sense, doesn't it? He's trying to teach us a way to gain wisdom where there was once ignorance. And everything the Buddha would teach for the next 45 years of his teaching career until the day he died was in the context of the Four Noble Truths because that's what he wanted to develop an understanding in all of human beings. So the first noble truth, remember that this is, an, this is the result of ignorance. As a result of not understanding the true nature of life in the world, dukkha occurs. And when the Buddha first described dukkha and consistently throughout his teaching career, he described it this way, that birth is suffering, sickness is suffering or dukkha, aging is suf suffering, Death is suffering. Then he said, not getting what is wanted, what is desired, is suffering. And every one of us has certainly experienced that, haven't we? 
In fact, I would say everyone in this room has experienced all of that except that last part of death. We haven't gotten there yet. Then he said, getting, not getting what is desired is suffering, getting what is not desired is suffering. Again, nothing mystical and on the surface, not terribly profound, is it? Until you realize that we spend our entire lives chasing after what makes us feel good and doing everything we can to avoid anything that might bring disappointment. And in between those two extremes is most of life. And when we don't create a reaction in our minds, in other words, something occurs in our life that doesn't excite us in some way through attraction or aversion, we, we develop this indifference, which is another aspect of ignorance, isn't it? We ignore those things that don't get our attention. We ignore those things that we have not formed a self-referential view about yet. And that is most of life. And that's the essence of mindlessness. That's the, that's the basic human problem. It really isn't not getting what we want or getting what we don't want and reacting to that. It's what lies in between that we're missing because we're indifferent to it, because we've created this identity. The second noble truth is that craving originates and clinging perpetuates suffering. Now, rooted in ignorance, because we don't understand the true nature of the world, we start craving for things to be permanent when nothing can be permanent. And the underlying view of that is we're craving for a permanent existence for this thing called anatta, not a self. When the Buddha used that word, not a, not a self, he used it to describe the views that we hold of ourselves. Those views that you have of yourself are, do not constitute a self, let go of the views. That's basically what he's saying. The other traditions usually um, interpret anatta to mean no self and then leads to a, a, a process of trying to, to, to create this experience of no self, which is related to a misunderstanding of emptiness and nothingness. It's not what the Buddha taught. I just say that to, to give some background to it. What we think of as a self is not a self. So the last line that the Buddha would say in that description of dukkha, after saying not getting what is wanted or, or getting, what is, getting what is not desired is suffering, then he would say, in short, the five clinging aggregates are dukkha or suffering. And the five clinging aggregates are, are the easiest description is the five clinging aggregates is clinging to views that are rooted in ignorance. And we use those views to describe ourselves. The five clinging aggregates are uh, form, feeling, perceptions, mental fabrications, and the resulting uh, confused mind state that we have. And it's by clinging to views that we cling these aggregates together. In short, the Buddha is saying it's our clinging to views that are rooted in ignorance that cause all manner of suffering. The third noble truth is perhaps the most significant, I was going to say the most important, and it's the one that I kind of glossed over when I first came across the four noble truths. The third noble truth is that cessation of suffering and cessation of this ongoing process rooted in ignorance is possible. And why is it possible? Because one of those, the, the, one of those most important characteristics of the three marks of existence because of impermanence. If impermanence was a, wasn't an underlying experience of all of life, then change wouldn't be possible, would it? Cessation of suffering is possible. So within the problem of impermanence, a not self-characteristic and their interrelationship resulting in dukkha, we can use an understanding of the not self-characteristic and understand impermanence in such a <clears throat> profound way that we let go of everything. The third noble truth. When Kandana first heard this teaching, the very first teaching the Buddha ever heard, he awakened. And he awakened. When he awakened, he, he made this statement. He said that all conditioned things that arise are subject to cessation. Doesn't sound like a whole hell of a lot, does it? Until you realize what it means. When he said that, the Buddha said, and this is my word, bingo. I don't think he said it anyway. Bingo, you are now Anakandana. And Ana in that, in that context means you are now the one who understands. And what Kandana was expressing was this deep and profound view that even the views that I'm holding of myself, that I'm using to describe myself in this world are impermanent. All conditioned things, all conditioned views that arise are subject to cessation.
And if we can, if we can understand that at its most profound level, we'll let go of every view. Lao Tzu, the, the Chinese sage that developed the I Ching, uh, said that all once you recognize the impermanence of all things, you'll let go of everything. And again, getting back to the five clinging aggregates and clinging to views, that's the most important thing to recognize. So how do we recognize? If we have the problem, the common human problem of conditioned th thinking or a hardened shell, how can we possibly recognize those views so we can let go of them? That's why the Buddha <clears throat> created and developed the Eightfold Path. So the fourth noble truth is the path leading to the cessation of suffering, to all manner of confusion, delusion, and suffering. The path leading to the end of ignorance and the birth of wisdom in our own minds is the Eightfold Path. Right view, right intention, right speech, action, and livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right meditation. And that is the entire path and the only path that the Buddha ever taught. Just to reiterate that, and I know you hear me say it often, everything the Buddha taught was in the context of the Four Noble Truths. And the path that he taught to develop that profound understanding that ends the ignorance, that, that sets that chain of the 12 causative links in motion, is the Eightfold Pen. That's the introduction for this week's study. So what I hope you do as you're reading this chapter on the Four Noble Truths is look at it in that light and look at it how it describes our reality in a way that we can develop that profound understanding of life in the world. We'll finally gain the ability to understand who we are in relation to the world and we'll see it clearly moment by moment. And the last thing that I'll say about that impermanence is that once we fully grasp that, then we realize that each moment that we have in a human life while we're alive, each moment holds the potential to incline our minds towards awakening or to continue ignorance and continue the confusion and delusion that follows from that. There's the talk. Any questions on uh, this week's homework? Diane? It's not a question, it's good. I heard that the first time. I For saying that you reminded me of something that occurred i think it was the first retreat that we gave up at the one <laughs> it might have been the second and there was no it was the first there was a person there who was um uh she was a, a bhakti yogini i guess is the right way to say it um that's a that's a, a type of devotional practice that's rooted in hinduism um that's focusing um on expressing love for everyone and she was getting a little agitated, and I noticed it go, as the retreat was progressing. And she asked me one day, and she actually saw it, brought it up in a, in, a, uh, in a session that we were having, where's the love in this teaching? Where's the love that the Buddha taught? And the love is in the entire Dhamma. If you think about what this brings, the entire Dhamma is about bringing true love and true compassion to everyone by first developing it in ourselves. By first developing in ourselves and that's why i say you hear me say it often the most loving thing i can do for myself and for all other human beings is to take to the dhamma and awaken so thank you for bringing that up Yay! Laura. <laughs> all right i think everybody in this room is sophisticated enough to understand that that there are many aspects of love and there is this sentimental love that is a felt sense versus the intention and the view um, that is a very wide sense of truly unconditionally 
being present for what's arising. So when you were talking about that beautiful space too, that is often ignored, um, I, I, your clarity in describing that was um, clear. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's such an aspect of love to attend to that which is not pulling us in the you know, the, the like dislikes, you know, all our attachments and aversions. Like that's what I think people tend to think of this syrupy love, you know, it's all nice. Well, bullshit, you know, it, it's, it's very, very, it's very self-centered most of the time. And so I think these teachings accurately, as you said, have the deepest level of true goodwill and care. Yeah. yeah, thank you for saying that. You know, it, it, love has a lot of different meanings. Some of them are skillful and some of them aren't. <laughs> thank you for saying that. Eva. I think right action and right speech are the most loving yes. things you could possibly do. And then you don't think of it yes. as this love thing, but in reality, just sometimes being quiet and yeah. not getting into a thing with someone is the most loving thing you could have done and, it, and it grows and it yeah. goes forth. <laughs> and it, and it's, it's informed by those virtuous factors. Yeah. I mean, again, that's why they're there for a practical reason. I just love the, the going forth, you know, that teaching <laughs> just, by going forth in our lives with this path. That's how we do, you know, provide compassion and love. And I mean, you know, over the holidays, there was just some little thing that, um, I was in New York for work and, and my grandmother lived, you know, nearby where I was. So I made a call to my father and my mother. And I was like, Hey, uh, you know, I'm near where, you know, my grandmother and grandfather are, are buried. And, you know, I don't know if anybody's been there. I wanted to go find it. Tell me where it is. You know, and we're like, Oh, it's far away. I'm like, it's not that far away. Just tell me where it is. I'll, I want to go stop by, and put some poinsettias and some flowers and took a photo sent it to my mother or my aunts. And they're like, nobody's been there in 12 years. And they're like, Oh, wow. Like, I can't believe you did that. And, I'm, and and it's like, that's sort of the metaphor of going forward. Yeah, well, no big deal. Like, sure. And, and to see what it gave them, you know, that was an example of that true compassion. Hey, yeah, no big deal. I just picked up some stuff and put it there. But they were like, wow, you did that. And it's like, well, yeah, I did it. I don't know. I didn't, I did it because I just did it. I don't know. And, and I knew that they would like it. And, and it wasn't like I needed to make myself feel good, but it was the right thing to do. I'm right there. And I had the thought and, Sure, sure, I did that for you. No problem. <laughs> what a profound. I'm your son. Now. I'm like, yeah. you know, like, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's sure. Yeah, but it's, I, I just thought it was funny that going forth, like, I, I'm sure I would do that for you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's, that's great. Brett, did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, you just you said something about you know, spending your life, uh, you know, between things that continually make you happy, I guess, like just. In the, in the interim, it's all the things that you don't, uh, I guess, don't make you happy, like just the, the basic stuff. Let's keep in touch on that again. So what? Yeah. Most of, um, most of the occurrences in our life we're indifferent to. And because we don't have a, because we're stuck in a self-referential view, we don't even really notice it. There are things that we tend to ignore, but that's, that, that ignorance is part of that first noble truth. In other words, as we develop a, a less self-referential view, the things that we didn't even notice or think were significant become much more meaningful. And ultimately what happens is our entire life is meaningful to us, meaning because we're able to just be present. There's no difference between a rock and a rose, you know? But There's still miracles of. In 2017. I mean. Well, and yeah, there really isn't that much difference between today and tomorrow, is there? Except a note on a calendar. So, you know? um, when I take a shower, I notice that sometimes I don't remember if I've shampooed my hair because I haven't been thinking about taking my shower. I've been thinking about this thing that happened five days ago with so and so, or this thing that's going to happen five yeah. days from now, and then. Me taking care of myself, I'm not even enjoying it or aware of it. <laughs> it's just this yeah. thing that I'm ignoring so, so I can move on to the past or to the future. 
relationship. You know? And uh, really, I noticed when I, I, when I noticed that, then I noticed that in a lot of my middle ignoring things of you know what I had for breakfast, I, I don't remember because I wasn't focused. I wasn't yeah, concentrating on my yeah. life. I was concentrating on imagined past and yeah. present. And and you're yeah, you were still you were still thinking, but you weren't even aware of your right. thinking. Totally. You were distracted by your own thinking. I, I, I had the same problem. I used to always forget if I washed my hair or not. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Don was solved that for me. <laughs> You're right, John. The, uh, the, when you alluded earlier about the difference between an awakened person that you can observe and an unawakened is the presence. Yeah. And and it, it I that's that's so true. And I and I think that, that, that that's something that we can all recognize and, and appreciate people. But when I gave my dad's eulogy a couple of weeks ago, what was that Anthony, when you were with your father's dad? eulogy that uh, I gave a couple of weeks ago, I had a stack of letters that he wrote uh, to me because my wife saved every letter he wrote to me while we were married. And he wrote to me a lot. Oh. And I went through some of the things in there, but I said that the things that what and it wasn't the letters or the last vacation we took or the last phone call which was amazing it was the love i could see in him when i first saw him i could see a twinkle in his eye and when i sat next to him on the couch i could feel the love and warmth and when i left him i could see how sad he was and that's what i'll miss the most because that is the hallmark of love yeah. that's beautiful anthony thank you for saying that it's true. Uh, that's that's a yeah. Let's we'll, we'll, we'll end it. End it on that. That's enough. Thank you. Does anybody else have any? How I said we'll end it on that. Does anybody have any questions or comments before we we finish? So um, so this week uh, you'll study the uh, the four noble truths. We'll talk about it next week, and then I'll begin to introduce the wisdom factors on next Saturday. Um, so let's. Uh, We'll finish with, with the Buddha's words on metta, as we always do. Uh, find your relaxed meditative posture. And gently close your eyes and gently close your mouth. And again, take a moment to become aware of the sensation of breathing in your body. And let that mindfulness of your breath cease any distracting thoughts to the past or to the future or that may have arisen from our talk today. And metta, metta is both uh, an aspiration uh, for those of us developing the Eightfold Path, and an expression of a fully awake and fully mature human being. And these are the Buddha's words on Metta. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied. Unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, May all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Thank you all for a wonderful class. Happy New Year. Peace. Thank you. John, is that prayer anywhere on your website? Yes, it is. It's under um, guided meditations, and you'll see there's actually, yeah, there, there's a, a recording and, and a written. Uh,
part of it. So. What's up, my friend? So she's like, she's being like this. Like, I get a tow truck to pick up logs now, and I have the tow truck for one of the few years. Now I have it. Yep. Things don't really necessarily change. I think by getting all these things done. Well,